thank you for asking me to speak at this year's convention again. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you about the place of the newer treatments in ITP, um, some of which has been shaped by the COVID pandemic, which we are all suffering at the moment. So I will cover that in my talk, as well as discussing some of the older therapies and the problems associated with those. These are my disclosures. So with ITP, what would be the ideal situation for ITP or any disease, in fact, for that matter? Well, we'd identify people who really need treatment to avoid treating those who do not. We would discuss the management with the patient. We would select treatments which have high efficacy and low toxicity. We would use drugs that give a long-term remission when the treatment is stopped and would be associated with a good quality of life or a normal life, in fact. And that would be the ideal situation for a treatment. And certainly for ITP, it would be amazing. And if we were designing a treatment, the ideal treatment for ITP, what would it look like? Well, it would work for everyone. It would have no side effects. It would give you stable control of the platelet count and the patients would regain a normal life and forget about their ITP. So this would be the ideal perfect treatment for ITP. But the problem is that there are no medicines in the world which can do this. But some drugs, if you look at the TPO receptor agonists, l trombopag and romiplostin, they do come pretty close to this actually. They are at least 80% effective often higher. They have very few side effects and they are associated with a good quality of life. And you'll see that from the new consensus document. We have a quality of life section where we discuss this in both children and adults. Using these drugs gives you a good quality of life compared to the old fashioned type drugs that we used to use. So the old drugs that we used before the TPOs became available were not licensed for ITP. They were never designed for ITP, but they were better than nothing because that's all we had. And I'm talking about steroids. I'm talking about immune suppressants like mycophenolate, azathioprine, cyclosporin, rituximab, we've been using for a long time, not approved for ITP, dapsone, danazole, and other drugs. These were drugs that we had to use because we had to do something and nobody had developed a drug for ITP until the TPOs came along. So with the older treatments, we did suspect for a long time, although we had no readings, no data, we suspected patients were unhappy with the old drugs. But there was a study conducted by Novartis called the IWISH study, which is the World Impact Survey of ITP, where they sent questionnaires out to patients and healthcare professionals. And the patients clearly were unhappy with things like corticosteroids, because of all their side effects. And many of the treatments that we used had side effects for lots of patients. And the real revelation, or maybe it's not so much of a revelation, is that the doctors did not really appreciate how much the old drugs interfered with the patient's quality of life. So that was very useful information to have, and it shaped what we do now, in fact. So the old treatment goals for ITP, we always have a goal in mind with a disease, we're either trying to cure it or fix a broken bone or whatever, but the treatment goals for ITP, the old ones, we were trying to make people's platelet count normal and obviously avoid bleeding. And when it came to things like side effects and quality of life, we didn't really give it a lot of thought. We didn't give it nearly enough thought, in fact. But the new goals of the treatment, and this is outlined in the consensus document, which we've published, and also the American guidelines, they're much more realistic. They're, we're trying to prevent bleeding. We're trying to achieve a safe platelet count, something around 20 to 30 times 10 to the 9 per litre. Not normal count, just a safe count. We're trying to avoid drugs that have toxicity. And we're trying to maximise quality of life. So that really emphasises the the move away from the old toxic therapies towards the newer therapies, which are much nicer to take. So let's look at new ways to use a couple of old drugs and then look at the new treatments coming through. So the old drugs, steroids, nobody likes steroids. We've been using them for too long, 
courses are three months, four months, six months long, and the doses are too high for too long. But the new guidelines that we developed, and this is in the consensus, you will see we've laid out a strategy for reducing the exposure, the time on steroids. So what we suggest is that a patient have prednisolone at one milligram per kilogram of body weight, but not going above 80 milligrams, even if you weigh more than 80 kilograms, don't go above 80 milligrams, and do this for two weeks. And one of two things will happen. The patient will either respond or they will not respond. If they respond after the two-week period, then we wind the drug down, taper, over four weeks, and so the whole course is six weeks long. If they do not respond, then we will taper off over a, a few days. So the course will be two weeks and a few days and at most three weeks. So that's six weeks or two and a bit weeks, which is very different to the old strategy of leaving people on for months and months and months. And I think the quality of life like that would be much better. What about mycophenolate? This is interesting because mycophenolate is a nice drug and we've used this for quite a long time. There was a study put together by Charlotte Bradbury from Bristol and presented at the American meeting last year. It's called the flight study. And it was looking at the use of mycophenolate upfront for a newly diagnosed patient to see if the treatment failure would be less if you add mycophenolate right at the beginning than just steroids alone. And so what they did is they looked at adults with platelet counts less than 30, and they gave them either steroids or steroids plus mycophenolate to look at the treatment failure. And the treatment failure here is much less with mycophenolate than it was with steroid alone. So that's nice and interesting data. So maybe we should use mycophenolate right at the beginning. The only problem is um, the quality of life in the mycophenolate group was slightly less good than the steroid group for some reason. Okay, let's look at newer treatments, the licensed treatments that have been, actually been through clinical trials, randomized, robust data. What's so special about these newer treatments? Well, the older treatments I've already said were never approved for ITP and they impair the quality of life. The new treatments that have come through since the TIPA receptor agonists are fully approved. They've been through big trials, randomized, placebo controlled. They have really no, they, well, the new treatments like Eltromopag and Romiplostum have no immune suppression. And that's important during a pandemic. We don't want to suppress the immune system. And patients feel better on these newer therapies. So the new guidance in the, both the consensus guideline, which is the top uh, graphic there, and the American guidelines on the bottom, try to improve um, the quality of life by involving the patients in the discussions treat every patient as an individual, try to avoid anything toxic, be realistic about the treatment goals and maximize the quality of life. And that's a big change from our previous way of managing ITP. And it, it is of immense benefit to the patient if they're both, both patient and doctor are fully involved in the discussion about what to do, what to use, how long to use for, etc. So the whole thing started with Amgen and GSK, who developed the TPO receptor agonist way back 2008. They were approved. Novartis bought l uh, from GlaxoSmithKline. But these are the first two drugs approved, and we've used them a lot. Sobe have introduced a new drug called Avatrombopag, which is another TPO receptor agonist like l it's, a, it's available worldwide, but we haven't really got it yet in the UK, but it will be coming soon. And then Griffles and Rigel together have produced Fosamatinib, a sick inhibitor, which I'll discuss a little bit very briefly later. Another type of drug. They're all approved. Those drugs in that column are all approved worldwide, available to use. Some drugs are going through trials. There's a, there's a class of drug called the anti-neonatal FC receptor drug, which is anti-FCRN. UCB and Argenix are both developing and running trials for those drugs. They're not available yet. Principia are doing a Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor trial. Again, still in trial phase, not available. And then complement, which is part of the immune system. There's a, there are complement blockers, again, going through clinical trials. So the ones on the left are approved and available. The ones on the right will be available over the next few years, hopefully. So we'll have five classes of therapy at least. The TPOs, you know, l Romiplostum, 
The SIC inhibitor, the neonatal FC receptor blocker, the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and Comfort inhibitor. That's five different types of drug working in a different way, which is fantastic considering 10, 15 years ago, we had no drugs that had gone through clinical trials. So looking at these therapies, l Trombopag, Revelaid, many patients in the UK are on this. We've been using it for 10 years or more. There's a lot of real world data and lots of safety data for l Trombopag. Very effective, well tolerated and associated with a good quality of life. You can see from the graph, this is from the trial. The green circles are patients on drug and the pink square are the patients on placebo. The drug works clearly and we know that we've been using it a long time. Romiplostim, very similar, more than 10 years use, lots of real world data, very effective therapies, well tolerated and good quality of life. And again, the same kind of graph. You see the patients on drug in the black square and the triangles are placebo. So lots of data from l Trombopag, including safety data, lots of data on Romiplostim, including safety data, and lots of real world use of those drugs. Avatrombopag is the latest addition, small molecule, it's a bit like l Trombopag. There's not much real-world data because it hasn't been around very long, but it looks, from what I've seen, very effective, and it will be similar, I think, to l Trombopag. Now, we're allowed to use the drugs like l Trombopag and Romiplostin much earlier now because of the pandemic, because we're trying to avoid immune suppression. And the best drugs which are not immunosuppressive are the TIPOs, and they are good drugs. So there is an interim measure from the National Health Service allowing us to use these drugs very early. We don't have to wait six months, nine months, 12 months. We can use them right from the beginning, which is amazing. Much better for patients. And as I said, there's no immunosuppression. So the NHS has produced this document. It's called an interim clinical commissioning policy. It is interim, it's for the pandemic. What will happen after the pan pandemic? I'm not entirely sure whether we'll have to go back to the old way of using the drugs and waiting a while, uh, because they're licensed really not from the beginning. They're licensed, um, well, Romiplostum is licensed from early for ITP. l Trombopag is a bit later, but this is the interim policy in what we're doing. So it avoids using rituximab and lots of immune suppression. Now, these drugs like l Trombopag and Romiplostum, it looks, if, if you use them early, they do seem to work better. If you look at this graph, the two columns on the left are early ITP, the middle columns are later ITP, and then the ones on the right are even later. And over time, the longer you wait, the lower the efficacy of the drug, which is interesting. So that's another argument for using these drugs early in the disease, which is what we are doing more of at the moment. Fostamatinib, I did mention to you at the beginning, uh, sorry, earlier, that's a, another class of drug, which is from Rigel and Griffles, which works on an enzyme and it reduces the destruction of antibody-coated platelets. It's another way of tackling ITP, works for some patients, of course, it doesn't work for all patients. And if someone fails to respond to l Trombopag or to Romiplostum, then maybe we consider Fosamatinib. The data from the study has looked um, interesting. You can see I've pointed there to the purple line. The dark purple line is the patients responding to the therapy, whereas placebo, they did not. So it's another drug in the um, pharm pharmacology of ITP that we've got available to use if we're, if we're stuck and someone fails a TPO. So those are the approved drugs. But why do we need more drugs? Do we really need more drugs? Well, Many patients with ITP don't need anything. Some may just need one treatment. Others need other treatments. The TPOs are amazingly effective. We know that. l Trombopag, Romiplostum, incredibly effective. But they don't work for everyone. I told you that. They, don't, they do not work for every patient. Probably 10 or 15% of patients don't respond. So we need something for those patients who don't respond to a TPO receptor agonist. I'm not going through this diagram on the right. It's just to show you the complexity of what we're dealing with. But if we understood what was going on in ITP, we could design treatments better that might target specific parts of the pathway. 
So this is where these drugs have come from. These are trial drugs now, the neonatal FC receptor blockers. It sounds very exotic, neonatal. Why is it relevant to adults? Well, adults have it as well. Basically, this receptor in health recycles our antibodies back into the bloodstream. But that includes the bad ones. They also get back into the bloodstream. So if we can block it, then we stop them ending up back in the circulation, which is what we want to do. So these antibodies that we use, these receptor blockers, prevent the um, antibody, the antiplatelet antibody being recycled. And it removes, so it removes them from the, the circulation. So the platelet count goes up, which is very nice. And the trial data so far look interesting, look good. And there are two drugs undergoing, two main drugs undergoing clinical trials. They have really difficult names to say, actually. Rosanolixizumab, which is from UCB, and Fgartigamod from Argenix. Now, the trade names will be better. These are the generic names. This is Roxanolixizumab, and you can see the graph there on the right showing that patients on the drug, the platelet count goes up. Obviously, there are antibody levels, which the top column do drop, but it looks very nice from the initial data. Fgartigamod, placebo on the left, and, and drug on the right. It clearly works. Again, another class of therapy if you fail a TPO. So they look promising. What about the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors? Well, these are these are an enzyme. It's an enzyme. Bruton tyrosine kinase is an enzyme. And it works in a complicated way. But if we block it, if we block this enzyme, then antibody levels, antiplatelet antibody levels fall and platelet destruction drops. So there is a study, this PRN1008 of this molecule, it suppresses the antibody production, which is nice, and more than half of the patients in the study responded, which is great, and it has mild side effects, so it's even better. I don't want to talk about complement too much, it's part of our immune system, it may be involved in some patients with ITP, and blocking it seems to produce reasonable results in some patients, very early data. So let's look at the place of the new therapies. So before COVID struck, we used to use steroids and IVIG initially. That was our initial treatment. And then we'd go on to things like rituximab and Mike Fenley, and then end up on a, a drug like l or Romiplostin by about six months. That's what we used to do. But of course, we don't want to suppress the immune system. So what we now do, steroids and IVIG, of course, up front still as before. And then very early on, we introduce l and Romiplostin. And then if we have to, we look at other drugs. If, if the if the TPO receptor agonists fail, then we have to look at other drugs, rituximab, mycophenolate. But usually the TPO receptor agonists work more often than not, so we're fine. So over the past 10 years, the old therapies, the non-trial therapies, the azathioprine, mycophenolate, they've all dropped. And the new therapies, of course, are being used more and more. So what are we missing with ITP? Okay, things look good, but what are we missing? Well, understanding what's going on within an individual patient would be amazing, but it's not clear and we have no tests. We cannot tell a patient what is the exact underlying mechanism for them. And we treat everyone the same, we have to. And, but the outcome is very different. That's the problem. And it's because each patient has a different mechanism for their ITP. And personalized care, i.e. care for you alone, specifically for you, would be the ideal. So in conclusion, after all of what I've said, I think ITP management is much more individual than now than it ever was before. And we're using less toxic therapies and less ineffective treatment, which is good. And we've moved towards the new therapies, which are effective, tried and tested, having gone through trials. And I think soon we're going to have five or six classes of therapy for this disease, which 20 years ago had no classes of therapy developed for it. And the quality of life for patients with ITP will get even better. So watch this space and next year will be even more exciting. Thank you for listening.